Hello, I'm Thomas Hicks, Vice Chairman of the United States Election Assistance Commission. The EAC is an independent bipartisan federal agency created by the Help America Vote Act of 2002 to help election officials improve the administration of elections and help Americans participate in the voting process. We work closely with state and local election officials to make sure everything is in order for voters to cast a meaningful, secure, and independent ballot. By statute, our agency is responsible for distributing federal funds to the states, including 400 million in emergency funding last year to address election issues caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The agency also establishes standards for voting technology used in our elections. In February, we issued a new set of standards for voting systems that will pave the way for the next generation of voting systems across the country. I have more on that later. Our agency also maintains the National Voter Registration Form. And finally, we serve as the clearinghouse for best practices for state and local authorities to consult about election operations. Other federal agencies also play a role in the US election system. The Federal Elections Commission has oversight of the nation's campaign finance laws, the money in politics, and how those laws apply to candidates and committees. Many other agencies are also involved, even if their statutory mandate is not solely focused on elections. You may be familiar with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, which plays a key role in securing our elections infrastructure from both foreign and domestic intrusions. And the US Postal Service has recently been the focus of absentee and vote by mail efforts during the pandemic. With that level of complexity, it's easy to see how the electorate could fall victim to simple misinformation and how bad actors can introduce more malicious information through any one of those points of entry. Among our most important lessons from the 2020 election was the tragic reality that those threats can stem not only from foreign enemies, but also from within. At the same time, by its very nature, the decentralization system limits intrusions because any large-scale efforts would require targeting the separate states and local jurisdictions at the county and local level. By partnering across federal, state, and local governments, and with robust support from industry, civic organizations, nonprofits, and academia, we carried out one of the most secure elections in American history and continue to improve operations to secure continued success. And the road to repairing this damage remains long and daunting. But I hope the ideas you share and the connections you make at DEF CON gives everyone here the opportunity to think strategically about protecting our elections. To be sure, mis and disinformation succeeded in casting doubt about this fact. But what do we learn and how do we respond? At the broadest level, we learn that online mis and disinformation pose a threat to the elections process. And it's incumbent upon government institutions at every level to make sure voters and potential voters have accurate information. It also requires vigilance by the platforms where mis and disinformation appear to be honest gatekeepers. Finally, individuals have to be responsible for the information they consume. That means on the web, voters and the public should look for verified and trusted source labels. Voters can and should refer to resources directly from local and state election boards. This is especially important for voters checking their registration status and confirming if their, if their information is correct. In a response to the recent executive order issued by President Biden in March, we are diligently working alongside the General Service Administration 
to modernize and improve the user, user experience of vote.gov, where voters can find information they need to participate in the democratic process. Beyond this, our agency, as well as the rest of the election infrastructure, established numerous safeguards to monitor and engage future threats to our systems. In January of 2017, DHS gave the critical infrastructure designation to our election systems. This designation is given to systems and assets whose incapacity or destruction would threaten the country's physical or economic security. The designation allows the EAC to participate in the Government Coordinating Council, which provides for interagency and intergovernment coordination. It includes representatives across federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial governments. A sector coordinating council also serves as the counterpart to the GCC for partners in industry and manufacturing. The councils proved highly important as COVID restrictions started last spring. With about half of the states still needing to conduct their primary elections, the resources the GCC compiled proved highly useful for election officials. The EAC also launched several initiatives to support cybersecurity efforts at state and local level. The Cyber Access and Security Program provides resources like security training, best practices, expertise, and other assistance for election officials tasked with protecting critical elections infrastructure. Last year, we helped provide election officials with online cybersecurity training through a partnership with the Center for Tech and Civic Life, CTCL. To date, over 1,000 people have taken the training from 46 states, DC, and three territories. And this training remains available for free through September for anyone interested in attending. The EAC also launched the Risk Management and Crisis Management Online Workshop for state and territorial election officials. And the EAC hosted a joint CISA online risk management tool on our website, allowing officials at the local level to easily measure and mitigate risk to the specific environments. Leading up to the election in June 2020, the EAC also announced its partnership with the Center for Internet Security to pilot a technological verification program focused on non-voting election technology, including electronic poll books, election night reporting websites, and electronic ballot delivery systems. For the EAC, every discussion about election technology begins with our core statutory obligation, the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines. The VVSG are a set of specific and requirements against which voting systems can be tested to determine if the system meets requirement standards. The EAC first adopted VVSG in December 2005. This past February, we unanimously voted to approve VVSG 2.0. VBSG 2.0 is a major step forward to ensure the next generation of voting equipment is more secure, accessible, and ensures a better voting experience for all Americans. Election security has been a major topic and focus during these efforts, and I'm proud that the VBSG 2.0 includes provisions to ensure we have more paper ballots and built-in support for election officials to conduct more effective post-election audits, even more than ever, without sacrificing the mandate that those with disabilities can still vote independently and privately. These gains, along with many others, benefits to accessibility, security, and usability that come with a 15-year technological leap forward all are part of what makes the update so critical. This version reflects the push and pull of various policy considerations, but ultimately represents reasonable compromise that puts the agency in a good position, allows manufacturers to build to the requirements, and gives labs clear guidance 
to test and certify those machines and positions the EAC for considering enhancements in the future. This brings us to the issue of elections post COVID and the new systems and technologies that are being adopted across the United States. According to the Brennan Center, 25 states have passed 54 laws that lower barriers to voting by adopting election practices that were employed in 2020 in response to the pandemic. Those permanent fixes include more early voting options, like longer periods or additional days for in-person voting, more ballot drop-off locations, adoption of no excuse absentee ballot requests. In addition, two states, Vermont and Nevada, elections will be conducted entirely by mail, joining the five states that adopted all mail balloting prior to 2020. States have also adopted new procedures to minimize the rejection of mail ballots by allowing voters the opportunity to cure any defects or to verify their signatures. Through ballot tracking technology, some states and localities are even allowing voters to follow the progress of their ballots to ensure that it counts. And on the front end, states have simplified and expanded photo registration. For example, some states modify or struck laws prohibiting voter, for, preventing felons from voting. Others expanded registration to 17 year olds who are eligible to vote upon turning 18. Finally, a number of states adopted new technology to allow for accessibility, providing remote options for voters with disabilities. Today, more than 20 states in the District of Columbia offer electronic ballot delivery. Changing longstanding election practices, procedures, and systems is no small order. In many cases, this may require legislative action. And in 2020, governors and state legislatures across the country acted quickly to adapt election administration procedures to meet health and safety guidelines. Beyond those formalities are more practical considerations like the timing of the introduction of those changes, their implementation and ongoing monitoring and the need for voter education. For changes to and implementation of new technology, there is further consideration about balancing efficiency, accessibility and security. In the EAC's capacity as a clearinghouse for best practices, election officials can turn to our agency for guidance about how and when implementing election systems practices in their jurisdiction. As one example, let's talk about electronic poll books or e-poll books. These are voter registration lists that have been digitized to check voter eligibility at the polls. In 2018, more than one quarter of jurisdictions used e poll books. This was an increase of more than 50% from 2014. 36, state, 36 states use e poll books in at least one jurisdiction. Seven states use e poll books in all local jurisdictions. E poll books have some inherent security concerns. Thousands of e poll books can be deployed in a jurisdiction during an election. They may be networked to other ePoll books or an ePoll book central server or a voter registration database. ePoll books contain personal identification information, PII, including name, address, and age. In some circumstances, other data includes driver license numbers and voter signatures. They are potentially the target of attacks by nefarious actors that could cause potential polling place delays, turn away voters, or modify or delete voter registration data. Often, personnel with minimum security training are also entrusted with operating these e books. As part of our effort to guard against potential these potential security um, scenarios, the EAC will create a program manual that will describe key elements such as requirements and responsibilities for participating in the program. Requirements will be developed and published similar to the VBSG 
but with a narrower scope. They will focus on unique aspects of e-poll books related to security, usability, and accessibility. Testing will be conducted by EAC accredited voting system test labs, pistols. Test plan reports and relevant attachments will be posted on the EAC's website. And it will include typical system configuration, information like software versions, hardware use, and hashes. It will be voluntary and manufacturer's participation is necessary for it to be successful. States can help if they start requiring the EAC evaluation. In some instances, states may still need to provide testing to ensure interoperability with their specific systems. It must be agile. We don't want to cause too much. We don't want it to cause too much additional overhead in terms of time or cost. Currently, labs take approximately one to two months to evaluate. We believe that this turnaround can be shortened through standardization. We also want to support the ability for manufacturers to rapidly iterate to have their systems evaluated. The standards would need to be kept up to date depending on how the specifics the requirements are. The standards need to be updated frequently. This could be yearly or less. For election officials, the convenience and efficiency of using e books must be weighed against potential security threats. That's because this data must be stored somewhere. And many officials increasingly rely on crowd services from Amazon or Microsoft, for example, to manage these systems. Unfortunately, those systems are vulnerable to cybersecurity threats. As the 2016 election demonstrated, foreign hackers attempted to penetrate the voter registration databases of several states. By some media accounts, they were successful with at least one of those states being penetrated. Similarly, security measures are implemented. Officials may inadvertently raise barriers for voters with disabilities. So there is a need to protect against trading accessibility for security. Our goal is to do both. Then there are public education piece that voters with the information to help them navigate new systems and technology. Maybe even more importantly, this education component about making sure that the public understands any new system or technology is not only convenient, but also reliable and secure. For example, e-books have, e have made it easier for jurisdictions to adopt the use of vote centers. These are often larger, more centralized polling locations that combine several precincts where a voter can cast a ballot. E-poll books allow vote centers to more easily access information about voters across multiple jurisdictions with more ease than consulting traditional registration lists on, on paper. During the pandemic, vote centers played an important role in protecting both election workers and voters because in some instances, they were in larger settings like sports stadiums that allowed for proper social distancing. When used for early voting, vote centers allow voters to cast a ballot ahead of the election day and avoid traditional longer lines. At a time of uncertainty about the pandemic and the protective measures needed to prevent infection, election workers worked with their municipalities, professional sports leagues, and the media to inform voters about using vote centers to stay safe and to provide reassurance that their votes would count. I'll end here, but I look forward to the conversation and the collaborations that stem from DEFCON this year. Thank you.